together. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father God, as we get into your word right now, thank you. Lord, your word is truth. Jesus, you said that when you were praying to your father. Father, you said your word is truth. And Lord, as we get into your truth, we ask that it would be truth for us, because it is truth. Make it truth for us. Help us to accept your word as truth. And so, Lord, whatever it says, we will believe. Whatever it says, we will follow. We will grow. We will obey. Lord, may we be what you want us to be as you've already outlined in your truth. We ask this, Lord, through Jesus, in your spirit, in his name, amen. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 19, 1 to 9, and then 13 to 15. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went down to the region of Judea, east of the Jordan River. Large crowds followed him there, and he healed their sick. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? They record from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else, commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. Thank you. You may be seated. Today's message is called God's Prescription for Strong Families. We've been journeying through the book of Matthew in the Bible in a series called Just Jesus. And last week we learned about some of the privileges and responsibilities and promises that we have as children of God and citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We learned this simple principle. Humble position now, honored privilege later. This morning we're going to be temporarily skipping a half chapter up to chapter 19 so we can look at some principles Jesus gives us for properly approaching marriage and family because it's Mother's Day. In this passage, Jesus gives us a number of prescriptions that, if faithfully applied, help us to build and maintain strong families. Our goal this morning will be to study Jesus' teaching and examine four prescriptions that can help us develop strong families families, healthy families. Maintain them. Well, it's Mother's Day. Yeah, it's interesting. I was reading about Mother's Day. One person said, Mother's Day is the day where kids declare, my mom's a great cook. And they proceed to make her dinner and prove it that they were right. <laughs> because, yeah. <okay. laughs> there's, a, there's a number of different t uh, stories I was reading about, uh, funny stories about families and church. And I was reading about this one. Is there was a, they were in church and a pastor was praying. And right in the middle of his prayer during the worship service, a loud whistle uh, went out. And uh, the, it was, it just kind of pierced the whole congregation. It was Gary, little Gary. His mom was horrified. Later on, she said, Gary, what on earth made you do that? And Gary answered, well, I asked God to teach me how to whistle. And right then he did. <laughs> A little boy had come out of Sunday school class and he had come up to his grandpa right afterwards. They had been studying Noah's Ark and he said, Grandpa, were you and Grandma? Were you on, the, on Noah's Ark? 
And grandpa, was, grandpa was a little gruff. He said, no. His, and he goes, well, then how did you not drown? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot of different t- fun stories we can think about with kids as far as their relationship. I, I was reading about this one um, grandma and her, and her uh, little five-year-old boy. His name was Nathaniel, and they were walking along. They lived on the, more toward the East Coast. And um, they, uh, it was right when spring had just sprung, and it was beautiful. It was like they were walking along a meadow, and Grandma was, was just breath, you know, she was just, just taken by how beautiful it was. A lot of red and a lot of gold had just sprung out. And she was just commenting to little, her little grandson, Nathaniel, about how God had painted that. And, he goes, and, he, and Nathaniel said, yeah, he did. And, she, and he did it left-handed. And she said, left-handed? What do you mean he did left-handed? Well, he said, we learned, we learned in Sunday school that Jesus is sitting on God's right hand. <laughs> you know, it's fun how we, can, we, we want to teach our kids the way of the Lord, and in church it's important. But you know, sometimes me and the families can be difficult, can't it? What, if anything, do you wrestle with in maintaining a strong family? Is there maybe problems with your spouse if you're married? Uh, do you both maybe have a difficult time, maybe sometimes seeing eye to eye? Or, or maybe one of you have a hard time, or both of you have a hard time letting it go? Um, maybe you just have different concerns or priorities. Maybe it's your kids, your grandkids. Either trying to get them to act properly or have the right values. Um, the values you know that God wants them to have, but maybe, and you have and you want them to have, but maybe they just don't share. Perhaps, perhaps it's just that your family isn't walking tight with God and it concerns you. It works on your heart more than most things. Maybe there's something right now about your family that's really tugging at your heart. And it's hard to deal with. And maybe you're not even quite sure how to deal with it. And it's tearing you up inside. Well, the neat thing is, and that's what I want you to hear today. The neat thing is God really cares deeply about families. More than we realize. More than we can really know. When we study God's word, we see the truth that God cares deeply about marriage and family. And in fact, he is so... He's, Flat out, honestly, uncompromising in his devotion. And, and he expects us to be the same way in our, um, in our commitment to marriage and family. I, it's interesting. God's given us a lot of principles in his word about for, for families. And Jesus, in our passage today, has a number of different principles. Or by his teaching and his actions, give us some prescriptions, as we mentioned, to help us know how to stronger families. And we're going to look at those today. And they're based on two different scenes. First of all, the first scene was um, Jesus had already taught about marriage and family before. He already taught about that in the, in, um, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. The Pharisees heard that. They wanted to expedite on that. They wanted to take advantage and be opportunistic. Jesus had a very strict view about marriage. He had the strictest view. He had the strictest view against divorce. I mean, there were two popular views during, his, during Jesus' time. Two main schools of thought. One was the most popular, the overwhelming so, and there was one a little less popular. Well, maybe significantly less popular, but there was only two. The, the less popular, but, but present by a few, was the Shammai school. And the Shammai school believed that you could only get divorced based on the concept of, well, maybe if your wife is being a little unfaithful a little bit. Not that they're fully out and faithful, but just doing something that's consider questionable with somebody of the opposite sex. Only then would it be justified. Hillel school, that was the one that was most popular. Everyone believed that one. They said you can divorce your wife for anything, any reason. And that was the most popular. And that, and that was what the Pharisees were coming from that perspective when they were testing Jesus because they knew that Jesus had a strict view and we're going to look at that in a little bit. And he did. Based on Scripture. The second scene that we're going to look at is based right after that when some parents brought Jesus, uh, well, were trying to bring their kids to Jesus to bless their kids. And um, the, 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 fair, 
the disciples were hindering them from doing so. And Jesus had to kind of well, reprimand the disciples a little bit for that because Christ cares about kids. And what I, what I want us to do today is I want us to take a look a little bit at these different scenes and the, and the purpose is I want us to see what is God's principles for us in marriage and family? Because here's the deal. I'm going to be straight up today. Today's going to be a no... Well, every time we preach from God's word, no, it needs to be no compromise. Amen? Amen. Some days get a little bit more bold than others. Today's a bold one. I'm going to be straight up today. Because God's straight up. Jesus is straight up. So I'm going to be straight up today. Because, uh, because if you want the truth... That's the truth that helps us. It's not always what's fun to hear, but it's always what's best to hear. And, and what I hope today is you're, you're going to hopefully be a blessing for you and help you grow. Because and I'll tell you what, you know, in our, the way their society was back then, in some ways we can see the reflections of it today. I, in many ways we say, of course, way worse, right? See, for example, today, as you know, while Christ had a very strong view of marriage and against divorce. Our society today, too many circles, divorce is acceptable for any reason, isn't it? No fault divorce. Isn't that the phrase? And in fact, there's a, it's sad, there's a growing view that among many that think that divorce is an inevitability. Um, I, I'm blessed because I, my parents raised us in, in the Lord and all my, my siblings and all of us have remained faithful. You know, we've been married through the years. And yet, our kids, all of our our kids have friends. And my, for example, my kids, they say, no one stays married anymore. I said, you're talking to somebody who is. You, you got your aunts and uncles, your grandparents, both said, all of them have been remained faithful because they're all Christian. Yeah, but you guys are the only ones. Because they see all their friends' parents getting divorced. And it's, it's sad to see there's such a, a low view or value of marriage anymore. But there is. And there's a, and as you might know, there's even a, a lower value even of sexual purity anymore. And, and fidelity in marriage. There is a, a, a developing view, you might have heard of it, that you can even be unfaithful with your marriage. And uh, they call it polyamorous. That you can indeed be married, but you can have other people as long as you can still be committed. It's okay. Unfortunately, I have family members and no others who have are friends that way, and they think it's fine, and it's not. Obviously, there's a low value about marital purity anymore. And what's sad about this is it reduces the value of sex. They think it makes sex better, but it makes it worse, doesn't, doesn't it? It loses its value so much. And that's it's got against God's principles. And it's interesting. But what people don't realize, when we go against God's principles of marriage and family, sexual purity, all these kinds of things, it hurts us. It hurts us personally. It hurts our marriages. It hurts our families. It hurts our community. It hurts our society. You wonder why so much discord's happening in this world. Look no further than what's happening within the family. Look no further than what's happening within marriages. I uh, was reading this article by Roger Clegg. Um, he uh, wrote it for a Center for Equal Opportunity. Uh, he, he was presented all this data from the uh, Census Bureau, you know, the most recent census, uh, about how the, the impact uh, that, you know, the breakdown in our American society being directly related to the breakdown of American family. And he wrote this. I'm just going to read what he wrote. After quoting all the data, he said this. Besides which country you're born in, in my view, you know, after doing all the data, the most important factor by far 
in explaining disparities in all manner of life outcomes, poverty, unemployment, crime, education, you name it. It's whether you were born out of wedlock or not. For all racial and ethnic groups, 39.6%, basically 40% of all births in the United States are out of wedlock. And then he added this phrase, isn't that appalling? But here's the deal. Yeah, it is appalling. It explains the destruction of the family when too many children are being raised in single-parent homes without the benefit of both mom and dad models. It affects everything. Now, our goal here isn't to put down single-parent homes, by the way. In fact, there's some awesome single-parent moms and dads who are courageous, heroic, and they're in that situation at no fault of their own. And they're acting heroically and in their commitment to raising their kids. They're doing a phenomenal job. But what we want to do is to show that God is all in for the family. And he has given us prescriptions to help us build and maintain strong families. The blessing is we can experience strong families even when we have a societal tide fighting against us. If we just consistently follow and adhere to the principles and commands that he's given us. We need to believe and we need to follow these. We need to know them and we need to do them. God isn't just, these aren't the old phrase about the Ten Commandments, they aren't just ten suggestions, amen? That's true for any true, any command and any principle. God is the source of all wisdom. And when we get veer off even a little bit from his prescriptions, we're the ones that are in peril. He does it for us. These are guard guardrails. They're guardrails for our hearts. They're guardrails for our lives. They're guardrails for our marriages. They're guardrails for our families. They're guardrails for our community and our world. We just have to do what he says. And we need to be strict about it. We need to be like Jesus. I mean, Jesus was no, he not, he, we're going to see it. He was no compromise. I mean, he blew the Pharisees away by his no compromising in this statement here. And we need to follow his example. We, we need to have this attitude. It should go like this. I will bless, not digress. <laughs> Can you say that together with me uh, out loud on the count of three? One, two, three. I will bless... Not dig- Oh, we got to do better than that. Try again. One, two, three. I will bless, not digress. Yeah, and what we mean by that, of course, is we want to we choose to bless our families by being tenacious and adhering to God's commands and principles about it in His Word and following them and not digressing from them even a little bit. That we're, not, that we're going to be so tenacious and selfless and adhering to God's principles. By doing so, we're going to bless our families because that's truth. This is truth. It's either truth or it's not. Amen. And you know this. I'm not talking to believers right now. If you're a believer and you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior... You, hopefully, have had a very high view of this thing called the Bible. God's Word. Sometimes, the world wants to pull at you. The world wants you to get, question this here a little bit. Question that here a little bit. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? Trying to erase or put the little dinks, chinks in the armor of your full out commitment to this thing. But when we do that, we hurt ourselves and we hurt our marriages and our families from it. We hurt those around us because we are blessing everybody else when we follow this thing and not digress from it. I will bless and not digress. And following God's prescriptions for his family. And we're going to introduce now four family strengthening prescriptions that we're going to focus on right now. Let's look at them. We're going to, we'll start off by saying it this way every time. I will bless, not, like, not digress from my duty to, and here's the first one. 
Be in my marriage for life. Divorce is not an option. Be in my marriage for life. Divorce is not an option. That's out of Jesus' own words. And we'll look at it. You, go, well, you already think, well, what about that? No, 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 no what about it? Matthew 19, 3 to 8. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this, Jesus, that is, with this question. Shouldn't a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Well, haven't you read the scriptures? By the way, Jesus knew exactly what they were doing. And he went for it anyways. He didn't pull back. He knew they were trying to test him. But, and he knew exactly where their question was leading and he let it lead there because he, he, even though he knew they were trying to trap him, he was always going to adhere to the truth regardless of how it even appears. Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? They record from the, that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? See, that's the trap. Ah, you he fell for it. Ah, uh-huh. what about what Moses said? Deuteronomy chapter twenty-four. We'll look at it in a second. It's misrepresentation. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus knew where they were going. Yeah, what about that? Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. God truly did design marriage for life. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's being tested about his view on divorce, and because of his already pronouncing what they suspected to be a strict view about divorce, they were hoping to under, undermine Jesus' popularity among the people because everyone liked the idea of, I can divorce my wife over anything. <laughs> School of Hillel, man, they said, if she makes you angry for anything, she, she burns your dinner, she's got to go. <laughs> Crazy stuff. That's what it was about. In fact, well, it, they were just, it was just any and any reason. They completely obliterated Moses' concept here. And, that, and so they immediately appealed to that. Well, what about what Moses said? Matthew, Deuteronomy 24. Right? But they, were, they were saying that Moses commanded us. In fact, a lot of translations say, commanded us to, you know, to, to you know, give him a divorce. I mean, give her yeah, a, certificate, a certificate of divorce. But that's not true. And Moses wasn't commanding them to divorce. He wasn't even permitting them. He was just acknowledging a scenario where that people might choose to do it. Look at me at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. This is the big thing, and it goes through verse 4, but we don't have time to go through all of it. But let's look at verse 1. Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Having discovered something wrong with her, he writes a document of divorce, he hands it to her, sends her away from his house. See, Moses is not saying, come to send her away, commander. Go. He's acknowledging the scenario here. You know, he goes on to say, you know what? She married somebody else. You're forcing her to marry somebody else. And by the way, if that guy dies, you can't have her back. Why? You know why? why? Because you made her get, quote unquote, married to somebody else. You really, that's what Jesus said, essentially. You're making her commit adultery. God did not design divorce his purpose was not for divorce his purpose was for life together throughout life Moses acknowledged that some people in their weakness of their heart and their lack, and I remember I appreciate one scholar I, I was reading phenomenal he said you know what Jesus did not compromise here at all he was stricter than the stricter school because they said well you know if you're a little unfaithful then you, get, you can't no 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 and by the way, do you know, and the Jewish male mind, that if somebody was unfaithful, they already divorced their spouse, and they've already said by their actions they're married to somebody else, and they viewed it that way. They already okay, they're not viewed, they're not married to that person. They've already divorced this, their spouse just because they slept with somebody else. And you know, in the Old Testament, they, what they do if they were unfaithful in adultery, what they do? Stoned them. Absolutely. 
And by Jesus' time with the Romans taking over, that they didn't allow for that. But, that. but they still had the concept. They understood how hard, of course, that would be for the Jewish mind because they knew what God said. It's high view of marriage. And divorce was never God's intention. The principal reason for marriage being for life is it's an actual joining of two people by God. It's marriage is an act of God. You see, people get it wrong. They say, oh, it's just a piece of paper. No, it's not. That's the state. No, it's not. It's an act of God. Well, I said I do, and they said I do. Yeah, you're right. And by the way, and I do this every time I do a wedding. I talk to the bride and I talk to the groom. I say, in a moment, you're going to say I do. And in a moment, you're going to say I do. And you're not hearing it, but you know what? There's somebody in heaven. And he says, okay, then I do too. <laughs> and he just joined it together. You're joined by God when you say I do. Marriage for life. Matthew 19, 5 and 6. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart, split apart what God has joined together. Notice again that statement, God is the one that joined them together. When Sherry and I were engaged, or about to be engaged, and we talked about marriage, we made a covenant then. That word divorce, we never idle it, never say it with each other, ever. We called it the D word. And it was never, it's never, never even as an idle threat or an out of anger, outburst, ever. Or even hinted at. It's not an option. Another prescription for strong families is related to what we have already been talking about, which is, I will bless, not digress from my duty to be faithful in my heart and actions. In other words, Sexual purity, folks. Marriage faithfulness. Not being immoral. Matthew 19, 9. Jesus said, I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. Why? Because in that view, again, in the, in the Hebrew mind, she's already married to somebody else then by her actions. She's already divorced you. The word for unfaithful here is the Greek word pornea. It's where we get, obviously, pornography from. It refers to sexual immorality, particularly for innate, primarily fornication, sexual impurity before marriage. That's pornea. It came to be seen as including unfaithfulness before and or after you're married, during, you know, during your marriage. So that, and Jesus was using, talking through the Jewish mindset here, if a husband, while he was married, later discovered his wife had been unfaithful to him, either before marriage or during their marriage, that was an acceptable reason for divorce. Only that. Because again, that sexual act itself showed that they are decided to divorce you, they've already divorced you, and they've married someone else by their act. Isn't that deep? That's how they viewed it. But there's a, a letter of the law here, and there's a spirit of the law, isn't there? We shouldn't view our spouse's previous infidelities as an automatic get out of jail free card from our marriage. Like I should tire them now or I'll, I'll just remember this when they did that way back then and so if I ever, ever tire them or if I happen to find somebody else along the way oh but they did do that so I can now pull out my get out of jail free card and marry, there and, 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 uh, marry this other person. Folks, I've heard people do this. You know, it's interesting. But here's the deal, and I really appreciate this. Jesus did not compromise on his understanding, his view on marriage and divorce. The point he's trying to say is this. He said, you know, I design marriage for life. I want you to have it. So whoever you're with, stay with them. <laughs> Go all the way with them. That's his, that's his design. That's his intent. And the world wants to say something. The world always wants to come up with the exceptions. And the only exception Jesus mentioned there, as you know, was the unfaithfulness. But that's because they were already considered in that, in that mindset, already divorced by their actions. 
There was only one other allowance for divorce in, in the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and that's if you're a believer married to an unbeliever and they choose to leave you, then okay, you said, you let them go. You're not, you're not bound in those circumstances. Those are only two reasons. And you know what's, what's interesting is we need to stick to God's word. We can't be adding stuff. Can't be taken away, but we can't be adding either. We need to stick to what God's word. And we're at safety in there. Those are the guardrails for safety. Recently, I heard a, from a missionary who was on the field, and he told me about a Christian married couple. They've been active. They were Christian leaders, actually. And the wife learned years later that the husband had been unfaithful to her shortly after they'd gotten married. It had been years now. And he had been faithful since then. But she got word of it eventually what had happened before and she immediately left him and she sought God as to what she should do she was a really devoted Christian lady she is right now and she prayed like crazy wanted to honor God in this and she received what I it, was, it sounds like it really was a true death response from the Lord from God the spirit told her this yes Yes, her, his actions did annul your marriage if you want to go that route. However, he said, I will bless your marriage if you choose to stay. And you will have a blessing in service you wouldn't otherwise have. And she chose to do that. She got reconciled with her husband. They worked on it. They were strong again, tight. They back in, in Christian service together. And she said, we're experiencing that blessing that I would never have experienced if I had not... Follow God's lead in that. God's true to his word. His attitude toward it is not trite. It's real. Jesus did not treat God's word as suggestions. He treated it as complete truth. He didn't take away at all. The Pharisees did there. The both schools of thought did. One more than the other, but they both did. Jesus didn't. Also, by the way, about marital purity, that goes with the heart too, doesn't it? What did Jesus say about Matthew chapter 5? You look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart, right? Jesus wasn't just talking there. He sees it that way. When we're lusting, we're committing adultery. We need to repent of that. And we need to do all we can. We need to be very hard and cut ourselves off from whatever causes it leads us to do that. Next prescription, we're going to go with the kids now. We've been talking about marriage. And by the way, the best thing you can do for your kids is to have a good, strong marriage. You want to bless your kids? Have a great marriage. You know, people say, don't, you, don't ever stay together for the kids. Baloney, yeah, stay together for the kids. Stay together for the kids. You give them far more security if you're going to try to honor each other still. Stay together. What's the third thing? The next prescription is I'll bless, not digress from my duty to lead my children close to Jesus. Matthew 19, 13a and 15. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. It was common for parents to bring their children to the, air, uh, to the elders or leaders of the synagogue the night before the Day of Atonement. Um, so this might have been the occurrence, and we don't know that that's the occasion, that we don't know the circumstances surrounding this. But we, uh, whatever the backdrop is, obviously the parents had a high view of Jesus praying over their kids and blessing their kids. But the problem was the disciples didn't see it the same way. They saw it as an annoyance. And, and, and getting into Jesus uh, is time. You know, he isn't time. He doesn't have time for this. They had a wrong view about kids. There's nothing you can do that's more important for your kids' well-being, obviously, than to help point them to Jesus Christ. And you know, there's lots of things we can do. Our world's full of good things. Lots of good youth activities and different things. But the most important thing we can, and those are all helpful, but the most important thing we can do 
is point him to is bring him to Jesus. Point him to Jesus. Draw him to Jesus. Draw him closer to Jesus. There's no that's your biggest call. Your, your primary responsibility is to point them to Christ and teach God's word to them. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 6 to 9. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Talk about scripture and scriptural principles all the time with your kids and your grandkids, wherever you're at. And be diligent to bring them to church. Here, you're in class, obviously. Tuesday nights, we have a Bible, a, a, a teen group now, fifth grade on up. You know, be faithful. We have an adult study, so you can come in for your own growth. Model that for them. Your modeling is the best example. Get in the Word yourself. Be strong in your, in your love for devotion to Christ and His Word. Believe His Word. Don't say, okay, I'm going to believe this, but I'll kind of believe this, or I'll follow this, but kind of follow No, 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 no. Why do we treat some commands as commands and some commands as, as suggestions? What's up with that? Where did God say, you know what? This command, I really meant it to be a command, but this one, maybe not so much. He's the same. He does this again for us. They're guardrails for us, for us, to help us and protect us. The last prescription I want us to look at today is, I will bless not and not digress from my duty to genuinely value my kids and grandkids from my heart. You say, well, that's an obvious. Well, maybe, but not so much necessarily. Look at Matthew 19, 13 and 14. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. See? But Jesus said, hey, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. We mentioned last week, during the time of Christ, that children were not viewed very significantly in society. They had a very... They, they were not... <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately they, had, they were not highly esteemed or valued. And so when the disciples were arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, Jesus brought a child and brought him in front of them and said, you've got to be like this child to be great in the kingdom of God. God has a different way of looking at things than we do. God prizes that which other people value or esteem lowly. What some people consider less important, God considers most important. And children are way up there on that, on that ladder. And you know what? I think about this. I was, I was thinking about this. And I, and I, and I was thinking, you know what? I, it just hit me. Wow. Even more. How horrified God must be about abortion. Think about this. The most innocent of children... The most innocent of children, the ones who can't even speak up for themselves, are being slaughtered. They're being slaughtered. He has a different view than we do. And we need to get his view. Jesus spoke up for the children. And, and, and what God's saying in his words, we need to value our kids like crazy. Not worship them. Make a difference there. Some people worship their kids. Don't worship your kids. They're not God. You're not God. He's God. But as you follow his leadership, value them immensely. One of the descriptions of, of uh, prophecies leading to, about Christ. Prophesying Christ's return or Christ coming the first time, it was a description of um, John the Baptist. He was described as Elijah. It's in Malachi chapter four, verse six. It said one of the goals of, or responsibilities of Elijah or John the Baptist would be to prepare Christ's way. And, and the, look at what it said his preaching would be like. This is Malachi four six, the first part. It said his preaching. This will be John the Baptist. 
will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. In other words, our hearts are not just on money anymore. Uh, so many people, they, well, yeah, I value my kids, but you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta provide for them. Yeah, it's more than just providing money. It's more, for, more than just providing a home. It's more than just, you know, oh yeah, kiss them goodnight or whatever. Invest your life, your heart, your values into them. Invest yourself into them. Selflessness. That's the concept. Selflessness for the sake of your kids and grandkids. Well, we're done. Out of these four prescriptions we've been talking about, what's God been talking to you about the most today? Is there something that you feel like maybe if you're honest, it's you and God, okay, I will bless and not digress. I want to bless my family by not digressing. Is there something, you just even nothing else, if there's a, even a little hit in your heart or your mind, well, I kind of was getting a little compromisey about this. Okay, I'm going, to get, I'm going to get back in line with that. And so, is there something you'd be kind of a little compromisey about? Your marriage. Faithfulness. Your kids. Point them to Jesus before other things for them. Grandkids. Your values, steaming them, not just in words, but in your actions and your selflessness. Whatever it is, let's, let's pray about that. Last night we... Uh, had the blessing of celebrating Randy and Nancy's 50th anniversary. And it was an awesome event. Thank you, Nathan, for putting that on. Um, wonderful milestone to celebrate. Perfect timing. And I can see many of the qualities we've been talking about in today in those two special people. And uh, when you just talk with them, you just hear their love for each other. Respect for each other. They model what we've been talking about today. And my question is, do you want to receive God's blessings? His prescriptions, there's blessings in them. Ask Nancy, ask Randy, there's blessing in following his prescriptions. Let's pray together. In fact, can we all stand? Let's just pray to the Lord about what Lord is, what prescription do you want me to focus on here? Or it's more than one, whatever it is. What, what's God been talking to you today? And whatever it is, say, Lord, I want to be faithful to you. I want to be faithful in all four of these prescriptions. All the way, God. Is that your heart? Father, as right now as we thank, we just want to thank you first of all, Lord, for the truth of your word. I thank you, Jesus, that you don't compromise. You didn't compromise. Even when it was unpopular. When it came to well, anything in the word, including marriage and family. Lord, I thank you for your convictions, your modeling. Lord, help us to follow your example, your teaching. Lord, we talked today about being faithful to our spouse till death do us part. We talked about being faithful in our heart and our actions with them. And devoted to our kids and pointing them to you, Lord, and, and valuing them in our life and our actions and our heart, not just saying it. And I pray for every one of us here, Lord. That I pray, God, that, Lord, that we would model the, your prescriptions. You're an awesome God. I thank you for families. Lord, we want to thank you for moms. Lord, we <laughs> can't think of a better example than just moms, Lord, a selfless devotion to our kids. Selfless, selflessness for our children. Thank you for that example. That's how you are with us. I pray your blessing on every mom here today, Lord, and grandma. I ask, Lord, that you would bless them as they continue to do what they already are doing. Loving you first. 
pointing their families to you, Lord, if they're married, if they're honoring their spouses. And I pray the same thing for the men too, Lord. Lord, help us to be people that model to our world what it's like and what, what true marriage and family can be like if we just follow your word. Thank you for your prescriptions for success, Lord. We love you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.